Good day. Welcome to this Monday's lesson on physical science brought to you by toenable.org. Um, in this lesson, we're going to carry on going through the June common paper. Um, it is Eastern Cape common paper. And as I mentioned to you before, it is available on the Turnable platform, not through the app. You have to come in through the website and come and you just can download the, the paper and you can try and do it either with me or ahead of me. Or you can, if you've missed the first couple of lessons you can do the paper and then watch the repeat of this the recording of this lesson so just to tell you about that if you have clicked on the seeing this video any video that you miss or if you miss part of this video it is recorded so all you do is go exactly the same route that you did before to get to this video and you will see a recording of it okay um i would strongly urge you to join the grade 12 science class it is anonymous we don't really i mean i don't really mind who you are if you put your names down as anything else we're not here it's not like a proper class like at school um but the reason i would like you to join it is because obviously on the platform you've got hundreds of um access to hundreds of um, sources and materials and everything else but if you join the class then you can message me so the whole point about this is eventually to become very interactive and you guys can tell me the sections that you're struggling with and we can aim to uh, work on those sections because the whole point about this is to try and make sure that you get the best results possible from this resource Right, so let's get started by going, continuing going through the June Common Paper 2. And we were busy looking at question 5, which on question 5, there was a, oh, sorry, again, there was a beaker and there was a container that had acid in it. And uh, what happened was that during the reaction, the mass of the beaker and the contents decreased. And the reason was that there was gas given off. OK, so that's what we did in the last lesson. In this lesson, we continue with this question. And the only part of the question that's really left, as far as I recall, is that, no, there's two, is that you need to plot a graph of the mass of the contents of the beaker versus the time for the time interval from the naught to the sixth minute. And they've given you a hint. They said, no, the graph is not a straight line. So all you really need to do is plot these points on this graph and then draw a best fit line. Isn't it nice that they've given you the beautiful graph, okay? So there are a couple of things. The first thing is that if you're not drawing this graph with a pencil, then I feel that you have missed the point of the graph, okay? <laughs> Guys, please draw your graphs with pencils. Why? Because they only give you one piece of graph paper per exam. I know if you're writing a test or whatever, your teacher might be nice and give you multiple copies of this if you mess up. But in the finals, you get exactly one copy and putting tipics down, drawing tipixing over a mistake is just ridiculous. So use a pencil. If you make a mistake, you can use an eraser to fix it and then you can continue drawing. Obviously, I don't have that option yet. So I will be drawing in my red ink. Okay, so what you need to do first of all is to plot your points. So another reason I'm going through this with you is because I find a lot of my students do not read graphs very well. They don't read the numbers very well. Um, and, and the other reason I want to go through this with you is to point out that they sometimes just give you the graph paper and they require you to draw everything, including the X and Y axes and that. So first of all, there should always be a heading on the graph. So graph of mass of beaker and contents versus time, beautiful. Secondly, there should be headings for both the y-axis and the x-axis. I know they've given this all to us. I'm pointing out what we would have to draw or write in if they didn't give it to us. So you'd have to tell them what this is. This is the mass of the beaker and the contents, and you have to write the unit. And similarly, the time, and it has to be the units here. Next up, you have to obviously fill in your values. Now, you will notice here that we started zero here and we're going one, two, three, four, five, six, and they are equidistant. Over here, we started 186 
and then we move up to 192. So these do not have to be the same scale. Do you notice that the X and Y axes do not have to be the same scale. One block here is one, and admittedly one block here is one as well. But this starts at 186, and then it's 187, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. What's important is that these are equidistant from each other, okay? So you can't go 186, 190, 193, 194, okay? It has to have the same value between each gap every time. That is the most important thing, so they have to be properly scaled. Okay, and then we just need to look at each of these little box and work out what their values are. Now, obviously, this would be easier in real life because this graph would be a lot bigger. But if you look at this, you can see that this one is halfway between years. Yeah, so that's going to be 187, which means that every single one of these little box is worth a 0.1 of a decimal. Okay, and we started 186. The simple reason that the smallest number here is 186.7. So we're starting slightly big lower than that. And we end here at 192 because there's space to go above it. Okay, so at zero, we're at 192.4. So that is going to be one, two, three, and four. So that's 192.4. And you need to put a nice big dot there, or you can even put a cross, that's fine. But you need to show it, okay? There are marks allocated to showing these points. The next one is 188.8, that's 188. That there is 189, so we're taking down two, and there's my dot. Then it's 188 is at two. Then there is 187.4, so that's 187, 1, 2, 3, 4, 187.1, oh, it's terrible, very small. Then it is, number 5 is 186.7. And it stays the same. So therefore, that is going to be 186.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And that's also going to be 186.7. Now, the next thing that has to be done is that you need to draw a best fit line. And again, I'd like to state that this is much easier done if it's done on paper with a pencil because you've got a bit of friction going. I do not want to see, and no teacher wants to see this. Okay, say you've got your points that do this, 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 and this. I do not want to see, and neither does your teacher, straight lines that go like that. Okay, let's say that's the point and that's the point. This is not a junction or a joining up of a whole bunch of straight lines. It is one continuous graph, so you need to draw a best fit line through these points, okay? So you need to do this very gently and you need to join them up as best you can through all the points and I've missed one but it's not a big deal. Okay so those are is a best fit line. Another thing I don't want to see and this is very important just because it says sketch a graph does not mean that you want to see this happening. This isn't art. We don't want to see beautiful sketching and hash lines. We want to see one single line and if you miss a point like you did here if you are using your pencil and eraser you can erase the sign and gently go through that point. If that point is very far out then leave it out because obviously you're drawing a best fit line so you want to get through most of the points okay so that there is your graph and it's with four marks because of the fact that there are marks allocated for one plotting all the points correctly and two for drawing your best fit line now just to go back for a second if you had to look at this, what would we say? We would say that the initial rate of reaction was quite high and then it slows down. And at this point, you can say that it has ended. Right, happy. Let's move on to the next question. It says a certain mass of calcium carbonate chunks is added to excess hydrochloric acid. Okay, in solution in an open beaker placed on the scale as shown, okay? So this is the question we've been going through all along. I'm just repeated it so that you can remember what we we're talking about. Okay, so we had this beaker. It's on a scale. Okay, 
I apologize, I'm not a very good artist. It's on a scale. There is calcium carbonate chips, so it's CaCO3 chips that were placed in it. And there was some hydrochloric acid in it, HCl. Okay. And they said it was at a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. And here is the equation. You've got calcium chloride plus your uh, calcium carbonate plus your hydro hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid gives you calcium chloride, carbon dioxide, and water. And this being given off is why the mass decreased, right? Now it says use the collision theory to explain how the rate of the above reaction will change when the initial temperatures change to 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it's important that we use the collision theory and we're talking about the rate. We're not talking about what the outcome is gonna be, we're talking about how fast this reaction is gonna be. And please note that they're talking about when the initial change temperatures change to 30 degrees. So do you see the initial temperature was 50 degrees? So what have we done? We've increased the temperature and that's important. The first thing is we've increased the temperature. So what happens if we increase the temperature? Now this is important. It doesn't matter if it's an endothermic or an exothermic reaction. An increase in temperature will increase the reaction rate. Okay, whether it be endothermic or exothermic makes no difference. It's going to increase the rate. It will affect the outcome. If it's endothermic and we add temperature, you'll get out more products. If it's exothermic, exothermic doesn't like temp hot heat, so you'll get out less products. But increasing temperature increases the reaction rate. And why is this? This is because temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles. Okay, it's actually a measure. The temperature is defined as a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. That's, if I had to ask you what is the definition of temperature, that's what you should be telling me metric. So if I increase my temperature, what's gonna happen? My average kinetic energy of my particles is going to increase, okay? So what happens? That means that there are more particles moving around and therefore there are more effective collisions per unit time. More effective collisions per unit time. Grade 12s, if you write just more effective collisions and you leave out them per unit time, you are not going to get marks for this answer. Okay, you have to say, in four marks, you have to say there's an increase in temperature, means there's an increase in reaction rate. Why? Because we are increasing the average kinetic energy of the particles, which means they move more and they move faster, which means we have more effective collisions per unit time. Okay, and that is the essential phrase, the phrase that is the money, the the money phrase, okay, the money shot. If you do not have this phrase in your explanation, you can forget about getting your marks when you're talking about collision theory and rate. If the rate goes down, then you're gonna go fewer effective collisions per unit time. And if the rate has gone up, you say more effective collisions per unit time. Very important question. Right, let's look at question six. So we've been talking about rates of reaction now. Obviously, we're doing chemical equilibria. So it says the following reaction reaches chemical equilibrium in a closed container at a thousand degrees Celsius. And you can see it's a nice theoretical equilibrium because there's X's and A's in there and there's nothing on the periodic table that matches A's and X's. So we're saying two moles of AX3, which is a gas, forms two moles of AX2 plus X2, and just check that's four and two is six, so yes, they are balanced, okay? And you'll notice that it is a dynamic equilibrium, it's a chemical equilibrium, right? So the course of the reaction is illustrated in the graph. So we've got, yeah, is our AX cubed. So we start off with lots of AX cubed. It goes down and then it comes back up again. Okay, that's AX cubed. 
I'm going to change colors so we can find this easier to read. I just want to highlight the different sections. Then we've got AX squared. And again, grade 12s, I would suggest that in exams, if you get something like this, feel free to highlight it. Okay, I wouldn't highlight it as something that's going to cover the readings because obviously you might have to read something off the graph. But if you can highlight it so that it makes it easy for you to read and understand what's going on, then please feel free to do so. Right, now let's answer some questions, shall we? Right, and also grade 12s, as I mentioned before, if you're doing an exam on physical science and you get given that 10 minutes reading time, I really would suggest that you use your reading time productively. And this is the type of thing you could be using, looking at in your reading time. You could be looking at this graph and you could be reading the questions and looking and going, okay, fine. Well, it's pretty obvious that my AX cubed is my reactant because I'm starting off with lots of stuff. Okay, and then we carry on, et cetera, et cetera, okay. Now, before I do anything else, we need to read our axes. This is very important because this, it doesn't matter if this is a chemical equilibrium graph, could either be in moles or it could be in concentration. So you always need to read your y axis and this is in moles. It's in moles. So it's the amount of stuff, not the concentration. Okay, it's very important because that might make a big difference to your calculations if you have calculations to do. Right, so now it says explain the term chemical equilibrium. So this is theory and you need to learn it. And basically, the definition of chemical equilibria is a stage in a reversible chemical reaction where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Okay, so in other words, it might look like the reaction has stopped on a macroscopic level. If, in other words, if we're looking at it, we might not see any changes. It might look like nothing's happening. But on a microscopic level, the forward reaction Okay, in other words, AX cubed is breaking up into two AX squared and X squareds, and at exactly the same time, at exactly the same rate, the X squareds and the two AX squareds are joining up together to form AX cubes, and that is what's happening at a chemical equilibrium. Now it says, use the graph to determine when the time the reaction took to reach chemical equilibrium for the first time. So the first time it reaches chemical equilibrium has to be when the number of moles does not change in any of the reactants or products. And I would say that is at four minutes. So at four minutes, we have reached chemical equilibrium. By the way, chemical equilibrium can also be called, and you guys might recognize it as dynamic, dynamic chemical, and that's actually optional, equilibrium. And the reason why we tend to call it dynamic equilibrium versus chemical is because that dynamic gives you the hint that the reactions are still continuing. Okay, it hasn't stopped, it's still continuing. Okay, never mind. So the time that, okay, now it says, the number of moles AX cubed at the first equilibrium. So you need to determine the number of moles of AX cubed at the first, AX3 should I say, at the first equilibrium. So if we look at this, this here is at four minutes and that is 0 0.6. So if I have to look at my graph very carefully, and again this will probably be bigger on your exam paper, that is 0 0,5. So the number of moles of AX3 at dynamic equilibrium is 0 0,5. Now it says calculate the volume of the container if Kc is 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2 at 1000 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we know that Kc equals the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. Okay, right, so the concentration is number of moles over volume. Do you agree? Okay. So we could say that let's let the volume equal V. Okay. So do you agree that the concentration at equilibrium 
of AX3 is going to be 0, 0,5, concentration number of moles of 0, 0.5 over big V, right? The concentration of AX squared, AX2, sorry, is going to be 0, 0.6 over V. And the concentration of X squared is going to be 0, 2 over V. Right. Now, your KC formula, your mass expression, is the concentration of the product. So it's going to be AX2, but it's all to the power of 2 because of the coefficient is 2, multiplied by the concentration of X2 all over the concentration of AX base 3 all squared. Okay, so what we need to do now is substitute these letters and this number here into this and then solve. So we have got 2,5 times by 10 to the negative 2 is equal to AX squared, concentration of X2, shall I say, is 0, 0,6 over V, all squared, times by X2, which is 0, 0,2 over V, all divided by, and I'm doing this slowly, 0, 0,5 over V, all squared. Okay. So now I need to cancel and to rearrange. I need to erase some writing so that you can see what I'm doing. So let's erase this. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange. So first of all, let's make this look pretty. So we're going to work out what not 0.6 times 0 0.2, 0 0.6 squared times 0 0.2 is. So let's get out our calculator. And we're going to go 0.6 squared times 0.2 equals, and it's 0, 0, 0.72. So we've got 2, 5 times by 10 to the negative 2 is equal to oh, 0, 0, 0.72. 0, 0, 0, 0.72 all over v cubed divided by, which means we're tipping and timesing, times by v squared over, and if you don't know what 1.5 squared is, let me show you, it is 0.5 squared, oopsie, let's try again, 0.5 squared, which is going to be, oh, I'm so sorry, 0, 0,5 all squared equals a quarter, which is 0 0.25. So it becomes 0, 0,25. So do you agree these V squares cancel with this V? Okay, so you end up with 2, 0,5 times by 10 to the negative 2 is equal to 0, 0, 0,72 over 0, 0,25 V. And then you have to rearrange things. So you go V is equal to, and we're just cross multiplying really, is equal to 0, 0, 0, 0,72 all divided by 0, 0,25 multiplied by 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2. And let's put that in our calculators. So, fraction 0, 0, 0, 0,72 over bracket. 0, 0,25, close bracket, open bracket, 2.5, exponent, negative 2, close bracket, move it over, equals, and we get this horrible number which is useless to us in science, so it becomes 11.52. So the volume is 11,52. And what is volume measured in? I'm really hoping that you'll all be shouting that the SA unit for volume is decimeters cubed, decimeters cubed. Right, and that's how you would calculate the volume. It's actually a very nice question. Moving on. Okay, so let me just erase all my writing now. 
it says the change in the number of moles at t equals eight seconds. So there's a change. And we can see the change actually messed with the dynamic equilibrium. It says is, and it's caused by decrease in temperature. So there was a temperature decrease. Okay, temperature decrease. And it says, is the forward reaction endothermic or exothermic? Explain your answer by using Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, so let's have a look what happened. Do you agree that AX cubed went up and AX2 and X2 went down? So what happened? The reverse reaction was favored. So decrease in temperature favored the reverse reaction, which means that the forward reaction would be favored by an increase in temperature. So let me write this down. A decrease in temperature favored the reverse reaction. Okay. That means that we can say that, and how do we know that? Because as um, the temperature increased, the concentration of your AX3 increased, which means that the reverse reaction was favored. And therefore we can say that the forward reaction is endothermic. Okay, there we go. Next it says, just erase this. What effect will addition of a suitable catalyst have on Kc? Write down only decreases, increases, or remains the same. And the correct answer is remains the same. Grade 12s, the only thing that affects Kc is temperature. The only thing that affects Kc is temperature. Catalyst does nothing to equilibrium. Catalyst gets the reaction to the end faster, but it doesn't actually change the number of products or reactants. So therefore, catalyst has no effect on Kc, and the only thing that affects Kc is temperature. So the correct answer is remains the same. Right, question seven. Oxalic acid, and they've given you the formula COOH2, ionizes in two steps as shown below. So you've got your oxalic acid plus water gives you HCEO minus, so it's formed a negative ion and anion, plus water, okay, or actually plus a hydronium ion, and then you've got HCEO minus plus water again gives you a second ion. And you'll see here the Ka is 5.4 times 10 to the minus 2, and here is 5.4 times 10 to the negative 5. First of all, they say write down in words what the symbol Ka means. So we know what Kc means. Kc is the equilibrium constant. Ka is the same type of thing, except that it's just for acids. So it's called the ionization constant. So Ka is called the ionization constant. Ionization constant. Why? Because it gives us a measure of how much something has ionized. Right. Now it says, why is the temperature at which Ka is calculated always given? And because that is because just like Kc, Ka is dependent on temperature. Okay, Ka will change if the temperature changes. It's exactly the same as Kc. Now, water is acting as a base in both these reactions. Okay, now it says, write down the formula of a substance that acts as an ampholite in these reactions. And what is an ampholite? An ampholite is something you can act as both an acid and a base. So if you look over here, yeah, this is acting as a base, which means that this is acting as an acid, right? And do you agree that this dude here is giving away a hydrogen to become a base? Okay, so yeah, he is a base. And these two are conjugate pairs, conjugate acid-base pairs, right? Over here, they tell you that this is acting as a base, which means this is acting in the acid. But that is the same as this. 
So therefore, which of these substances is acting as both as an amphalite? What is acting as both an acid and a base? Is this H C O O bracket two minus? That there is acting as both an acid and a base. And please note, grade 12s, if they ask you to write the formula and you know the name and then you write out the name, you will get it wrong. If they ask you for the formula, you write the formula. If they ask you for the name, you write the name. So that is the formula. Now it says, write down the net equation for the ionization of oxalic acid. Okay, so let's start off. Let's write it out all together. We've got COOH2 plus water is in dynamic equilibrium with HCOO2 minus plus H3O plus, right? You also have HCOO2 minus plus water is in dynamic equilibrium with COO2 to 2 minus plus H3O plus. So the net equation means that we just add up all our like terms and cancel what we have on opposite sides. So that cancels with that, right? So you end up with COOH2 plus two waters, okay, is in dynamic equilibrium with COO2 to minus plus two hydronium ions. And that is your answer. Right, now it says question 7.2. A sodium hydroxide NaOH solution of volume 40 cubic centimeters and concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed is prepared. Okay, so the minute that I'm seeing this, I'm thinking there's something wrong and what is wrong with this? They've given me a volume of 40 cubic centimeters and a concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed. And what's wrong with that is that these aren't the same units, okay? They have to be the same units to be comparable or even relatable. So obviously somewhere along the line, I am going to have to change one of these units and it's going to be this 40 cubic centimeters, but we'll worry about that in a second. But this is the type of thing you have to note, right? Now it says calculate the mass of the sodium hydroxide needed to prepare the solution. Okay, so the formula that we're given is the number of moles is concentration times volume. Okay, we have the concentration, it's one mole per decimeter cubed, and we have the volume, but like I said, this volume is 40 cubic centimeters. We need to convert the cubic centimeters into decimeters cubed. And the way to do that is to divide by a thousand. Okay, if you don't automatically remember that, let me help you. There is a thing called King Henry died while drinking chocolate milk. Okay, it's a bit negative, but there you go. And you guys might have your own saying. Okay, kilo, hectare, deca, deci, centi, milli. So this is deci, this is centi, e, and this is milli. Okay, and this year, the reason why it's called while is because this could be liters, meters, whatever, grams, you name it, bytes, whatever. Okay, although bytes isn't in the decimal system, but you know what I mean. Okay, right. So the point is that we would normally say that there are 10 decimeters per, the 10 centimeters in one decimeter. Okay, so there are 10 centimeters is equal to one decimeter. However, it's cubed. So because it's cubed, it's whatever this value is cubed. So therefore it's 10 cubed centimeters is equal to one decimeter cubed. Okay, do you understand that? If it was centimeter squared to decimeter cubed, then squared, then it would obviously be 10 squared. Okay, right, so that's how we get this. So therefore we're gonna take this and we're gonna divide it by a thousand to get the actual volume. So therefore the number of moles is equal to the concentration, which is 40, div oh, sorry, the concentration of one, multiplied by volume, which is 40 over a thousand, which is 0, 0,04 moles, okay? But they didn't ask for moles, they asked for mass. 
and it says calculate the mass of sodium hydroxide needed to prepare the solution. So we also know that number of moles is mass over molar mass, right? So therefore, the mass is number of moles multiplied by the molar mass. And at this point, you need to get out your periodic table because you need to go find the molar mass of your sodium hydroxide. And the number of moles is going to be 0, 0,04. Your sodium hydroxide is obviously it's Na, O, and H. Oxygen is 8, hydrogen is 1. And this year is 30 something. So you end up with a molar mass of 40. So therefore, our mass is going to be 1,6 grams. 1,6 grams. And that is the answer to question 7.2.1. The mass of the sodium solution, sodium hydroxide required is 1,6 grams. Right, next they ask us a really long question, so we need to erase all our writing. Okay, now it says, 40 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide solution of concentration 1 mole per decimeter cubed is added to 50 cubic centimeters of 0, 0, 6 moles per decimeter cubed of sulfuric acid. The reaction taking place in the flask is given below. Okay. So what are we doing? We're titrating, right? We've got a base over here of sodium hydroxide, and we have an acid over here, sulfuric acid. So we're doing a titration. And it's pretty obvious because we've got an acid here, and we've got a base, and we're forming a salt, sodium sulfate, and water. So an acid and a base form salt plus water. Now they're asking us to work out what the initial moles of sulfuric acid is in the flask. Okay, so let's have a look at that. We know that number of moles is equal to, again, your concentration times the volume. They tell us that the volume of the sulfuric acid, again, they've given it to us in 50 cubic centimeters when we need it in decimeters cubed. So we're going to go, okay, fine, that's 50 over a thousand, that's the volume, times by the concentration, which is 0, 0, 6. And if we pop that in our calculator, we're going to get 0, 0, 6. 3, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, and that is the number of moles. And why is this important? Because of the fact that whenever you're working on anything, you always work with moles, so we need the moles. Okay, now it says they want us to calculate the pH of the solution in the flask after the completion of the reaction. Okay, the pH of the solution after the completion of the reaction. Now, first of all, cool thing about this is we're going to be using the information we've worked out in 7.2.1 and 7.2.2, right? But you get positive markings. So let's say you messed up with the number of moles here. It's okay because you'll get positive marking as you move forward. Okay, so we're going to look at the ratio of the number of moles of sulfuric acid to the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Okay, so let's look at that. We've got two moles of sodium hydroxide to one mole of sulfuric acid. Okay, so do you remember that we worked out that we had from this, our sodium hydroxide's NaOH, the number of moles we had was 0, 4. We've just worked out the number of moles of H2SO4 is 0, 3. So which of these moles do we have in excess? Okay, we've got 0, 4 moles of this and we've got 0, 0, 0,3 moles of this. So do you agree we've got tons of this, okay? So the number of moles that we have in excess is actually your sodium hydroxide. This here is in excess, in excess, okay? And we can work out how much is in excess by taking the initial and subtracting the reacting, okay? And let's have a look at that. We've got Okay, we also know, hmm, I'm wondering if I should, 
Okay, so we know that we have got 0.03 mils of H2SO4, right? But the ratio is 2 to 1. 2 to 1. Therefore, the number of moles of sodium hydroxide we're going to use is going to be multiplied this by 2, which is 0, 0, 0, 6. So that is the number of moles that of NaOH that we're actually going to use. That's the amount we're using. So do you agree we can say that therefore we can work out what is left over? We started we started with 0, 0,04 moles of sodium hydroxide. We've used 0, 0, 0, 0,06 moles of sodium hydroxide. So what is left in solution? Do you agree that what's left in solution is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0,034 moles of NaOH? That's how much is left in solution right? We'll then have used up all our sulfuric acid. Okay, all the sulfuric acid will be used up, but we'll have this much left in solution. Okay, now we also know our total volume. Our total volume is going to be 40 cubic centimeters plus 50 cubic centimeter, which is 90 cubic centimeters, okay? So therefore, we can say that it's 90 out of our 100 is going to be the volume that we have, the concentration we have. I mean, the volume we have, sorry. So 90 over 1,000. So out of the total volume, 90 out of 1,000, 90, sorry, let me try again. I'm sorry, let me try it again. This bit here adds up to 90 cubic centimeters, which is 90 divided by 1,000 decimeters cubed. So the total volume of the whole container is going to be this, okay, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Okay, that is our total volume. We have the number of moles, it's 0, 0, 0,34. So do you agree that I could now work out my concentration, right? I could say my concentration equals number of moles over the total volume, which is 0, 0, 0,34 divided by this 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and that is going to give me the concentration, which works out to be 0, 0,378 moles per decimeter cubed. So that is my concentration of my sodium hydroxide. And why is that important? The reason that's important is because sodium hydroxide is a very strong base. So sodium hydroxide is going to break up entirely into Na plus ions plus OH minus ions. So the concentration of the sodium hydroxide, which is 0.378 moles per decimeter cubed, is the same as the concentration of the hydroxyl ions because they break up in a one-to-one -one ratio. Then, you need to know that the concentration of the hydroxyl ions multiplied by the concentration of the hydronium ions always equals 10 to the negative 14 because that's how the pH works. Okay, we know that pH is equal to minus the log of the concentration of the H3O plus ions, right? But we know what the concentration of the hydroxyl ions is, so we can pop it in here. So we can say, oh, this is messy, concentration of the hydroxyl ions. Okay, sorry, let me just erase that. I'm running out of time, let me just do this bit quickly. The concentration of the hydroxyl ions is 0, 0,378 multiplied by the concentration of H3O plus equals 10 to the negative 14. Okay, and then we can solve for this and we can get an answer. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to leave you again at this point. 
I'm going to say go through this question and try and work it out. And in fact, what I'm going to do is tomorrow I will start with this question again and I will explain it again, but I'm going to change this page so it's much easier for you to read. And then we can work slowly and make sure you understand. Right, um, please go and watch the video of this and the recording of this to make sure that you understand this and then come back tomorrow for more science. Have a great day.